It has a diamond clasp, <coughs> and it sold for $3.7 million at Christie's wow. in the year 2012. Ooh. Wow. And you don't wear so, that to the grocery no, store. No, you don't wear that to the grocery store. <laughs> you don't wear it anywhere for fear it'll fall off. <laughs> okay, well, what's the largest pearl that was ever found? Well, that would be the pearl of, and I may pronounce it wrong, L-A-O, Lao Tzu, T-Z-U. I'm not quite sure exactly how to say that. Mm -hmm. Um, it was pre previously called, and I don't like this name, but previously called the Pearl of Allah. You can see why I don't like that. But it was the largest known pearl. And why I'm bringing that out is there are certain people in this class who might be very interested to know where that pearl was found. Do we have anybody from the Philippines here? I, <laughs> I thought you might all enjoy knowing that the island of Palawan, is that how I say it? Palawan. Thank you. Okay, in the Philippines, found by a Filipino diver. The largest pearl, okay? And it's got quite the history. Um, uh, I won't go through all the detail, but it's got quite the history. So there's also something called the Pearl of the Orient. What is the Pearl of the Orient? Well, it's the Pearl of the Orient Seas. It's the historical and romantic moniker for the Philippines. Mm -hmm. That's why I saw heads going. It's like, okay, so I'm telling the truth. They're, if you haven't gathered it, they are from the Philippines, so they can call me out. <laughs> so, um, and uh, the, the Manila, the capital of the Philippines is nicknamed the Pearl of the Orient. So if you hear that, that's what it's called, okay? Do you get the idea behind those little figures that what I'm trying to bring to you is a pearl, something very precious, something very special, something that is uh, just unique. That's the word, thank you, unique. I'm reminded, and you may not know and understand, that the pearl is not the irritation. I. I'm quick to tell that since I'm a pearl. <laughs> that when that, that clam or that oyster is, is uh, what actually what happens is a grain of sand gets in. That grain of sand is an irritant. The pearls, uh, I'm sorry, the oyster secretes a, um, a material. Okay, not a man-made material, but what the what God made its, it, the pearl, the oyster's creator to do. It secretes it's this. Like a, and it's, it's, like a, it's like a biscuit um, milky enzyme, yeah. Okay. okay, okay, good, enzyme, okay. And that wraps around that grain, and around it, and around it, and depending on how long it continues is how large that pearl becomes. Mm -hmm. So the pearl is actually the relief. When it stops forming that pearl, it has found its relief. When we find Messiah, we find our relief. And, 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 yes, yes. And again, we cannot go buy the Messiah, but anything we have a value, it fails in comparison. I would tell you, sell all to gain Messiah if you needed to do it, but you don't. He freely gives. So, are you wealthy? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, and I saw him. Yes. Mormons teach a lot on the pearl of great price. Mm -hmm. and do they believe in it the way we believe it, but they have such a different doctrine? They have a different doctrine, have a different explanation, and I'm not ready to give that to you at this moment in time um, because I need to go refresh my mind and study on it. So I can bring that back if you'd like, you know, for me to give you their definition. But the the one word of caution I will give you when you hear Mormon doctrine, and I realize this is going out on video, but I have to call it out because it is false. If you want to know if it's a cult or not, you look at what they do with Yeshua Jesus. Mm -hmm. Depending on what they do with Jesus, it's either a cult or it's not. <coughs> if they are looking to Jesus only as the one who can save us from our sins by his perfect sinless shed blood, that he died, rose, and lives forever. Well, when he died, God was still alive. I'm saying this poorly, but I'm trying to say it quickly. That's our target. We know that's correct doctrine. We know that we do not buy our salvation, that he freely gave it. His blood shed in our place for forgiveness of sin. Now, if we add anything to that, we are false, and it will go under the category of a cult. If we say anything different about Jesus, Yeshua, Yeshua's a Hebrew word, by the way. It just I bring my Hebrew out for the sake of understanding, but it's one and the same. If we do anything different, then it 
to claim what I just did and the very fact that he is God himself. He is not under God. He is not less than God. He is 100% equal with God the Father. We see our Jesus as one part of the triunity of our God. All three equal. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. If we deviate from that, we are into what would be a cult. If anything else can save you, if anything else is needed besides Yeshua Jesus, then it goes into the cult category. That's your best way to define what is a cult and what is not. Now, as soon as I've done that, I can hear the wheels turning, I can see the thoughts in the mind, and everybody's saying, okay, but what about, and they want a name. I'm not going to go through the different, and it may step on toes because of your background, but think of something that you were involved in that you did not feel was cultish. But when you come down to the pure definition of a cult, it may fit, and you may have to just accept that. It's not that it's bad to call it that. If you understand the reason for calling it that is to bring people's attention to what truly saves. Okay? You're not saved because you were born in America, and America is a Christian nation. That would mean if you were born in the garage, are you a car? <laughs> no. So it's, it's critical. It is critical that people not miss salvation by 18 inches. That they've got knowledge in their head that's never been applied to their heart. That they not have a bunch of facts, a bunch of knowledge that could be right or wrong facts even, but it has to be internalized, it has been personalized. Because in my Jewish background, the way that I find it easiest to explain it is the way I say it in Scripture. That God gave to the Jewish people a symbol outwardly of their belonging to the Jewish nation. That's the symbol of circumcision. When Shaol Paul, who is one that we highly respect in his teachings to us, when he talked about the outward uh, circumcision, he said that's worthless when it comes to your salvation. You need the circumcision of the heart. The circumcision of the heart means that God has cut that heart. He has broken open that heart that it now sees its need for him, for the, that saving blood that I talked about. To receive salvation is to receive that blood. Yeshua said on the cross, it is finished. That means he did everything that needs to be done. We are now safe. So if we're not having to work for our salvation, then, oh good, we've got our salvation, and now let's just sit down and let's just put our feet up and let's let the rest of the world go by and we'll just wait till I have time to go home and be at the Lord, right? Wrong. <laughs> we are called a holy living. That holy living we see in the standard of the law. It's not that God throws out the law and says, don't have anything to do with the law because then you don't have chaos, you have anarchy. If you don't have rule, if you don't have right and wrong, it does not work. It would be a horrible place to live. But what it means is that we don't live under the condemnation of the law. That's what the Lord took away for us. We are no longer condemned. In our sins, the wages of sin is death, eternal separation from God. We now have that eternal life with the Lord. And now that he put his spirit in us, circumcised our heart, with that spirit in us, he enables us. And, of course, we're all in this process. But to live right before him. That's living the sanctified life. And every day we should be inching closer to that perfect, holy standard of living. In that perfect walk, wanting to please our Lord, wanting to be obedient to him, wanting to do what he commands in his word, we're going to be working. We're not working for our salvation. We're working out our salvation. We're bringing it to others. We're letting them know, hey, this is something you want to. It's the best gift I ever got. And great news, it'll cost you nothing out of your pocket. It's provided to you freely. And then we share. So that's what I come a long ways from where I started. But in answer to your question, no, when, when this cult that you've mentioned refers to the Pearl of Great Price and, and their teaching, they're often something else. Their definitions are different than ours. The Mormons will tell you, oh, I believe in Jesus. And if you talk to them for a short time, they sound very good. They also look very good because they do many good works, many good deeds. They care about others. They try to help others. 
but they are doing all those good deeds, hoping to work their way to heaven. And when they talk about Jesus, they equate Jesus and Satan as brothers. That takes my God off of the place that he belongs. He is the one true and living God. No one else. Amen. No one else comes up there. So as soon as that happens, no. Now we've got a problem. So even when they talk about this Pearl of Great Price, they're talking with different terminology, with different meaning. And if you talk with them long enough, you'll begin to see there are many other differences also. Okay? I know. Okay, back on track then. So we're looking again at this, this pearl. We're looking at 12 pearls because we see that the gate is so large. And I, I was going to try to find a video, and I, I didn't have the time. But I saw one once that took the pearl, and it opened it kind of like the oyster. And the hinge was at the top so that people could walk through. That's, that's a good idea. Might be on the right track. Do we know? But one day we'll walk through the gates and we'll know. <laughs> because remember, whose home is this? God. And our God, God lived there all alone, all by himself. This is where our citizenship is. Remember, our citizenship is in heaven. New Jerusalem comes out of heaven. We know that that, that is our right. That is our city. Because remember, it's the bride <coughs> being described. Who is the bride of Messiah? We are the church. We are the ones who, who are believers now. So this is our home. We're going to go through those pearly gates. We'll know exactly what they look like then. The gate is a place of judgment, but uh, it, you have to, in, okay, I'll put it this way. You have to go through judgment to enter in, but that judgment, remember, the Lord took our judgment. The Lord's blood is in our place right there. And I believe that that's why we're also seeing, even in the pearl, I believe it mentions, and let's go back to Revelation, I believe that it brings out a transparency again. Remember the streets of gold that were all um, transparent? They're reflecting and they're seeing uh, in transparency. Yes, it does. The 12 gates were 12 pearls, with each gate made a single pearl. One pearl make up the whole gate. It's city's main street. Oh, no, it's a city street. Okay, it was pure gold, transparent as glass. But remember we talked last week, we're seeing the diamond in the gold setting. We're seeing the engagement ring, which is what the Holy Spirit is for us, our engagement ring, as good as the wedding ring. So in that, tying it in again, still we see transparency through here. It is open to reflect the glory of God. Nothing is blocking it now. Nothing keeps that away for us. So even though the gate, uh, and especially down here on earth, the gates of the cities in Bible times was where the court was. That's where, remember Ruth and Boaz, the story of Ruth? Of Ruth? Remember when Boaz wanted to talk to the one who was the nearer kinsman? He went and sat in the gate and waited for that one to come. And then when that one came, he called him aside. Oh, you know, come talk with me. Right there, they had the other men. They would have their court. They would have their decisions made. It was known as the, the judge, um, the courthouse was the gates of the city. So again, the gate, the judgments on the outside, shed blood would go through the gate. Who gets to go through the gate? Right. Those who are in that shed blood of Yeshua and Jesus. So all done for us. Now the materials speak of also of an indestructible character of the city. You cannot destroy these, these elements that I'm talking about. The gold, the, the pearl that's so large that is big enough to be a gate is a perfect pearl. It's not our little, <laughs> uh, they're rough. But it is a polish, it is a gorgeous, it is a beautiful, it is indestructible, and it leads us right into the city's main street. So there is a main street. This main street was pure gold, transparent as glass. Remember again, for those who heard it, I'm sorry, but for those who are new, I'll tell you, um, just to help you understand, it's a story, okay? <laughs> Hear me loud and clear, it's a story. Before this person died and went to heaven, this person made a deal with the Lord. The Lord made the deal with this person. This person was just... <laughs> this person was bent on taking a suitcase to heaven. Got permission that he could take this suitcase to heaven. So as the stories always go, there's a pearl gate, and there's Peter at the gate, and of course everybody pictures a little gate that you just opened. You know, now we know it's a big pearl. But you know, in our 
in our story. We've got the gate, and Peter's there to control who comes in. And he sees this person approach with his suitcase in hand, and he's all excited because he's coming into heaven. And Peter's, uh, 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 wait a minute, leave the suitcase outside. You can come in, but your suitcase can't. Oh, no, 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 no. I got special permission. I asked all the way up to the Lord. He himself said, I get to bring this in. Peter said, uh-uh, there is no way. Well, just go ask, because I know the Lord will tell you, I got permission. Finally, Peter sends another angel to the Lord, who sends the messenger back to tell Peter, yes, there's an exception to the rule. Let him bring his suitcase in. So he picks up his suitcase, and he marches in, and he is just so happy. He's in there with his suitcase, and Peter says, you know, I'm just dying to know. I've lived in the glories of heaven. What on earth could you be bringing into heaven that could be so valuable that you had to bring it in? Let's see what you've got in your suitcase. And you put it down and you open it up and he sees gold bricks. You know, gold is our most precious uh, stuff down here on earth. And, and Peter looks at that. Asphalt? You brought asphalt to heaven? <laughs> That's what we're trying to compare. We're trying to take our yes. earthly goods and even compare what heaven is like. No. We, it's all left behind. The glories are beyond our, our, our mind. They literally, I told you last week, let your mind explode. I took you out to, to Beetlejuice, which is a, a star in the sky. It's not the movie. Um, let me tell you also, You've heard a song about Lucy, the diamond in the sky? Yeah. Well, I'm going to tease you. I'm going to let you go do your research. If you can't, come back and I'll give you the answer next week. But go find out about the real diamond in God's sky called Lucy. That's who they based that song off of. It's very interesting. God is phenomenal. He is so far above us. This earth, at its best, is under the curse of sin. And that thing down here, reaches the level of up there. So we have to realize that that's why we can see gold as transparent. I can kind of picture that in my mind. I've got an idea, and I'll bet when I'm up there looking at it, I'm going to laugh at myself and say, you thought you had an idea? You didn't have a clue. You know, because again, we just can't comprehend. And the exciting part is he's made it for you. This is your home. And remember, Yeshua was a carpenter here on earth. And he said, I go to prepare a place for you. So he has been building. He has been forming. He has been making. And you're going to walk on what is most glorious here. But can you imagine what your abode will be like? That's right. That's better than the red carpet. Better than the red carpet. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, we have a city. We have cities down here. Where do you think man got the idea? God created into man's mind to help man know. Also, there were times like with Moshe, Moses, God showed patterns. When he made the tabernacle, remember, it was patterned after the heavenly. So it's no surprise that we have cities down here. If you have a city and you want people to be able to get around in your city, you've got to have a street. So it's no surprise there's a street up there. But what I can guarantee you is there's no congestion, traffic jams, red lights, <laughs> nothing like that. This street is broad also. Um, in fact, I think it was called a broad. Was it not? Okay, Main Street. When you get back into the roots, you get the idea that this is a broad street. Broadway, okay, and I don't mean Broadway, <laughs> but it would be a wide road. It would be like the public square, it, and I don't mean it has to be a square, but, you know, you have the main city. Go to Disneyland, okay? Disneyland is the happiest place on earth for little guys, and you know how they are in awe at Disneyland. Well, there's Main Street. Main Street's where all the kinds of action, everything's going on. The parade goes down Main Street. That's what we've entered into. We've come through the gate and we're in the main street. This main street is gold, transparent gold. That means it can reflect. What is it reflecting? What's all over heaven? Rosa gets an A. I can hardly wait to be here. Oh, I, I, I studied this and I got so excited. 
going to get pulled in my mouth. <laughs> because look at the next part. This, this is so beautiful. Look at what's not there. I'm telling you how glorious it is. I'm trying to get you excited. I'm trying to lift you above your little, in my word, puny idea. <laughs> look at what's not there. Something is missing. I, Yochanan, John, who is seeing it for himself, and I cannot imagine after seeing these glories, how he could stand and be brought back down to this boat. <laughs> Poor God. Okay. I saw no temple in the city. Let me read the whole sentence. I saw no temple in the city for Adonai, the Lord God of the heaven's armies, is its temple, as is the Lamb. Okay, we've got a whole lot in this sentence. So let's start just with that first phrase. I saw no temple. Okay, remember how important the temple is to the Jewish mind? And remember, Yochanan is Jewish. Remember, everything is focused around the temple. Their whole life revolves around temple. Temple worship, going up to the temple to say their prayers, going up to the temple to do sacrifices before the Lord came and was the final perfect Lamb of God who gave his blood. But even after that sacrifice was given, we still see Shaul Paul go up to the temple to do his prayers. Life is still revolving around the temple. So to Yochanan, this had to be a sharp contrast. No temple. I'm sure if he had had a moment to think, he would have thought, oh, well, I know how glorious our temple is here on earth. If this is so glorious, what does it look like? And he's looking for the temple, and there is no temple. Why is there no temple? We are because the temple. the temple is where the sacrifice was given. It was the place where God met them through sacrifice. And now there's no need for that sacrifice. God is personally with them. And that's the second part, which I heard many of you start to say. We know that we, it's told that we're the temple of the Holy Spirit right now. The Holy Spirit is in us, that, that making us a temple. I'm not saying things well today, but I think you're following me. So here is crystal clear. Let it radiate, let it glow, let it be transparent, let it be golden, let it be pearly, let it be all of this, and then take it up to another level. In the presence of our holy Shekhinah glory God, he is right there. It's no longer that we have to go into the temple to meet him. We don't have to go in with a sacrifice to put blood there. We don't have to go in with his blood all the time. We're not, there's nothing that separates us now. Nothing. That's what I want you to see. That place has to be, we have to have new eyes. I imagine it literally would burn our eyes right out of our sockets if we saw. Because remember that gold is radiating his glory. Remember the rainbow around the throne. How much more? Remember my theory, and I make it clear my theory, but we are wearing white robes. And when that prismic river that we've talked about, that river that, that's crystal, like glass, like a sea of glass, but it's river, it's water. When you have the water and you have the sun, what happens? Rainbow. I see rainbows re refracted, reflected, whatever word I should use, all over us. I don't believe we're going to be just solid white. God loves variety. He loves color. He, He's beyond us. So I'm seeing rainbows all over, reflecting on us, reminding us every time we live. Because remember, the rainbow is the whole redeeming story from the red blood to the purple royalty, all the colors in between. Every bit has significance and meaning. And now we're seeing it everywhere around us. I mean, this city sparkles, just absolutely sparkles. And I'm not doing fair to it. I'm not. I can't. I'm out of words that are not just earthly words. So we all have to just try to bring our mind above it. Remember when we looked at the millennium, millennial temple in Hezekiel, Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48. Go there again. Read that. How the glory of the Lord filled it. How beautiful that place would be. But again, that was on earth. An earth that's still under a somewhat of it is still, it hasn't been purified yet. It hasn't been, we're not, when we're looking at the millennium, it's before the new heavens and the new earth. So remember, this has come out of God's heaven. It's in space. It is our home. 
And now we're going to see a new earth when we're in this side of eternity where we're talking about. Because this which hovered over this earth, this earth now we know is a new earth. It's new heavens. So this, move it over here now, is what I would say. And it's hovering there. And it is in place of the temple because there's no barrier now. We are just constantly bathed in the glory of God. Have you ever had an experience with the Lord where you just feel like you're in that glory? Well, that never ends. That never stops. That's what we're talking about. The Greek construction of the sentence says, the temple, I did not see in it. Couldn't see in it. There wasn't a temple. Couldn't see it is the way we would put it. But the emphasis being on the temple, the first word. And again, what we're seeing is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. They are the only temple. They are the fulfillment of all that has symbolized our worship. Okay? They are who we're worshiping. They are, and I don't like this word, but they are the objects of our worship. We're right in there. We don't go into the temple in heaven to worship our God. We're in his presence. I can't say 24-7 because there's not night and day up there. There's not a week up there. It's timeless. It's forever, never out of that glory. Am I going over it and over it and over it and over it and just, it's like, okay, we're shall move on? No, the idea is I want you to see endless. I want you to see. I don't want anyone to miss this glory. When I know how glorious it is, I want everybody I know to come home to. I want everybody I know to be able to, to enjoy this with me. This excites me. This also helps me hang in there because if this was it, if we had to live through this forever, I don't want it. But that, yes, yes I want that. And I want it forever. And what makes the New Jerusalem really so special is not that we're walking on gold. It's not that we see a pearl so large people can walk through it. It's not all of these beautiful foundation colors that are all part of our environment. Yes, that's all special. But the most, the ultimate, the more than the cherry on top, the, what would be on top of the cherry on top the, that goes over it all is that fact that we are in the presence of the Lamb who sacrificed his life for us and we're in there in his presence forever and I don't feel like he's way over there and I might get a glimpse of him you know on, on the, the 10,000th year I'm in heaven no I feel like he's right here right in my face seeing his face his glory around this is more than precious this is so exciting. I don't want to get off of it. I don't want to move on. But I'm going to because the glory is keep the building. We've got no temple in the city for Adonai, for the Lord God of heaven's armies. Adonai Sabaot in my Hebrew. What's the Lord's heavenly armies? The angels. angels. Yes, the angels. Okay? So this city that has no temple, this one that I'm describing to you, he's about all the angels. Can you imagine myriads of angels? Angels, so many we can't number. They are also glorious. They are also bright. They are also special. But we've got this one that's even more special. And all of this is all around us. It's, it mentions specifically Lord God of heaven's armies. That makes my focus go to God the Father. The Father of it all. Above it all, of course, we know the Lord created. But I'm separating because it says it's is its temple as is the lamb. Do you see it, how it's talking about two different? Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. We just described God, and now we're going to describe Yeshua Jesus. In essence, is what we would be saying. And you guys say, but wait a minute. I thought we were talking about Yeshua Jesus because we were talking about the one who sacrificed. We were talking about how, how the, the blood is what brought us into the temple, and his, his shed blood has brought us in here. And my answer will be to you. You're right. <laughs> Let me take you back to Revelation 1. Remember Revelation 1? Remember the description? Go back and reread it. Are we talking about God the Father? And you'll say yes. And you'll give me certain words that sound like it's God the Father. And then a moment later, I'll just say, oh, oh, wait a minute. Now we're talking about God the Son. 
and then I'll take you back to the original covenant scriptures, and I'll show you how those titles were given to the Father and to the Son. And here's what we have again. We're being shown again the deity. Don't put the Lord less than God the Father, because it talks about him being the firstborn. Remember, that was in rank. That was in his human rank, that he was firstborn of this creation, the second Adam, to redeem mankind. That at the same time, when he was born, when he was put in the womb of a woman and born into time and space, he was fully God. Remember, the child was <coughs> born. The son was given because the son was never born. So when we see here, we're seeing the glory of God. We're seeing the radiant expression of his image, Hebrews 1.3, Yeshua, Jesus. This is what's in our city. And because of that, verse 23, the city has no need for the sun or the moon to shine on it because God's Shekinah, God's glory, gives it light and its lamp is the lamb. Okay, all this glory. We've been talking about, you know how bright it is. We've talked about how there can be no night, there can be no dark. You can't turn God off. It's, it, it just does not happen. Now we're being told at the same time also that the Lamb, and we know this Yeshua Jesus, the Lamb is the Lamb. Now, as soon as that's said, hopefully what, what's gone off in the mind is back to Revelation 5 where we see the heavenly scene. But let's go back even further than that, okay? And when we think about the lamp, with a Jewish mind, where do we go? Go back. If I keep you revelation, I'll take you to the lampstands that were the seven churches that were to be the light, because we're to be the light given out to the world. But what were they even? The lampstand. Go all the way back. Go back past the menorah that we see at Hanukkah time, but go to the, that's actually Hanukkah, go to the menorah in the temple. Go to the light that's in the temple. Always a light burning, an eternal light, a lamp that was always in the temple, never to go out. When you go into a, a temple or a synagogue today, and if it's called temple, it's reformed or best conservative, because they'll say that they'll call it a temple. To the Orthodox Jew, there's only one temple that belongs in Israel, and that's it, so they call their place a synagogue. So whichever name you're seeing, that either you go into, when you go into what you would call the sanctuary, look up, and you will see a light that is always burning. That light is never out. That's the fulfillment of that. Well, here we see what that was a picture of. That was showing them always the glory of the Lord. The light is the Lamb who is the light of it, who is light never goes out. Do you see how it goes all the way through scripture? Do you see why I say when we're reading Revelation and you think with the Jewish mind, you can no longer say, oh, okay, that's New Testament and Old Testament is for the Jews and New Testament's for the Christians. No, no, biggest disservice you can give to the word of God. It is all one book from beginning to end, from Bereshit, Genesis to Revelation, and we see the light all the way through. We see that God created light in this world, the sun and the moon. That we know light existed before that. What light existed before? God. God. That's what existed before. Always. And we see it continue. And we see it brought up now. So it should remind Yochanan. And again, he's, he's, he was looking for the temple. And the temple, by the way, was the permanent. The tabernacle was the, the temporary until they were in their own land and could set it down permanent. Mm -hmm. But the golden lampstand in the tabernacle was the light that, that it was contained in that way. So in essence, what I'm trying to say is, um, uh, I'm trying to think how to say it. I'm looking at my notes to try to help me. That the, the, I think I've said it, okay? That the glory of God is that lamp that lights it. It is the lamp that lights it and we walk in that lamp. Now, does that kick off a song? Thy word is a light unto my feet and a lamp unto my path. See how it all just comes together? Is that not beautiful? I've already quoted to you, I believe it. Let's look real fast at Hebrews 1 3. 
because it's speaking also of that light. I love keeping the one right through three, but I won't let myself get started because then I'll stay there the whole time. <laughs> Hebrews 1 and verse 3, and we read there the sun, because remember it says the lamb is the lamb. As soon as you say the lamb, we're talking about Yeshua Jesus. We're talking about the sun. We're talking about the one that Yochanan, our writer, said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Okay, so we're talking about the second person of that triunity. We're talking about Yeshua, Jesus, the Son. That's what verse 3 of Hebrews 1 is telling you. And verse 1 is telling you God spoke through all times. God the Father, in essence, Jehovah, is who it's saying there. By the time you get to verse 3, it's talking about the Son. The Son is the radiance of the Shekinah. What does that mean? He's radiating the glory of God. How is he doing that? It's better than a mirror reflect, re, reflection. Better than that. Because that's not an exact. It's as close as we can get to an exact. But this is as if God the Father and God the Son were reflecting each other. And we see that glory. The very expression of God's essence upholding all that exists by his powerful word and after he after he had, through himself, made purification for us sin, gives no doubt to who he's talking about. It's the Lamb, Yeshua Jesus. He sat down at the right hand of, and how does yours say it? I've got the Hebrew here. Hadadah, Bad Marim, the Majesty on High. Majesty on High, thank you. I could, I could get part of it. I couldn't get it all out of my Hebrew. Majesty on High. So this is the glory of the glory of the glory of the glory. This is the, the peak. Okay, look real quickly at 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Remember, we always like to see it in more than one place in Scripture so we know that we're teaching the truth, that we're not just getting off the building a doctrine that doesn't belong there. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4 says, They do not come to trust because the God of, the, um, of this world has blinded their minds in order to prevent them from seeing the light shining from the good news about the glory of Messiah who is the image of God. I read out of the complete Jewish, so you get that Jewish flavor, you get that idea, and immediately what they're seeing, when it's giving these words, is they're seeing that temple or tabernacle. They're seeing that light that has been shining. They're seeing that, that this is the glory of Messiah. And when you see that the Messiah is to be the image of God, that gives no room for any other Messiah. There is no other Messiah than the Messiah, the Son of God, very God himself, Yeshua, Jesus. Lastly, go to Colossians 2 and verse 9. I think we're going to come back to Colossians in time, but uh, right now we'll just look at verse 9. For in him, Messiah, so we're talking about from verse 8, for in him lives the fullness of all that God is. If I've done my job well, you are to the point that you say, wow, how do you ever separate God the Father and God the Son? You can't. You can't. You can't. Do we understand it? No. But by faith, we believe it. We know that this is true. And the spirit within the third part of that triunity should be resonating within your spirit right now. Yes, this is true. This is true. This is the light of the world. Okay. Now, <coughs> if there was any sun, God's glory is going to help you that sun, people. <laughs> that, his glory is so great, it would make the sun go dark. It is if you couldn't even see the sun. When there's a brilliant light, you can't see anything but that brilliant light. Well, that's our God. So, apparently, uh, the city is going to be, remember, is hovering over a new earth. Okay? It's lit. It's radiant. It's glory. It's not contained. We've seen the transparency. We see it going out. Apparently, this is going to be for the new earth, its sun. Apparently, because we're going to see as we get a little further down in this chapter, that they, the people that are living in the new earth walk in the light of the new Jerusalem, the new Jewish life. So this is the new sun. Yes, wow. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, Shall I see cool. it? And this part of this new eyes. Oh, absolutely. We got that whole new body. Because we won't be able to, I mean, with these eyes, I can't imagine being. We couldn't. Remember Moses? Yeah. Moshe? Mm -hmm. He only saw what was left behind. Yes. He only saw what remained after. He didn't see the full glory. And even that was enough. They had to veil him. And God had to put him in the hollow of the rock. 
pass by and then let them see what was left mm -hmm. behind. So yes, absolutely. Why are we changed on the way up? Because none of this is yeah. 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 so no. no. yes. 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 okay. yes. 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 Eyes that will never go dim. Yes. 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 Eyes that will never grow dim. Eyes that will never need glasses. Eyes that will never need Cadillacs. 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 Well, I don't know where you want to travel with your eyes, but you won't need to I can't believe I was trying to go too fast yes, in my mouth today to get cataracts or you'll yeah. never have anything oh, lacking. Yeah. It's just glorious, absolutely glorious. Okay, when man sinned, God withdrew his presence. We know that we're going back to the Garden of Eden. Remember, God will walk in the, the cool of the evening with Adam and Eve. We don't know how long that went on. But when they had sinned, then they hid from God, and it broke. There would be his, his, um, he had withdrawn his presence, and in the curse that came on them, this darkness comes on this earth. I'm talking about a spiritual darkness. I'm talking that, that we, we don't see until the veil of blindness is removed from the eyes, until God enlightens, until we see with spiritual eyes, we don't see these truths that we're even talking about. That glory was free over this earth before sin set in. And then sin robbed this earth of that. That is also why when God did the creation that we read in Genesis, why he brought in a sun and a moon, because now there was need for light into this. Uh, but again, when we go back, when we get to what God wanted from eternity past, we get to that perfect creation that will not need uh, even though we're saying we're the son of that earth, it's still different. It's not, they, there's not a darkness now. There's a. There's just a total uh, difference. I don't know how to say it. I keep fighting for these words. Um, our scripture tells us that the, the city, you know, it has no need of the sun or the moon or stars because all of that was our past. But we don't know what the new heavens has for the new earth. It at least has the glory of this being its sun. Mm -hmm. But we don't know what else. Mm -hmm. Scripture doesn't tell us. Question? I'm a little confused. When Adam and Eve were created, mm -hmm. they walked in the garden. Yes. Yes. So what was the garden? God's presence at that time. Well, by the time God put Adam and Eve in the garden, he had created the, mm -hmm. the lesser rights, right. the sun and the right. moon. Right. Yes. Yes. Um, so that's why I said when I was talking about the light going out, I was speaking symbolically that there was a spiritual darkness that came over this this earth that is still penetrating this earth. That we're all born into that. We're born in that darkness. We're not born with spiritual eyes that see and then they grow dim. No, we from birth need our eyes open to, to the um, truth, to the light. So in that sense, and maybe I confused you when I went to the symbolic rather than the real. No, I was saying that if that God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden, mm -hmm. so there must have been a, his light. Yes, there, yes, and absolutely. Not the light of the sun. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would think that it, it, in some way it must have been a more glorious yeah. light at, because of his presence, yes, mm -hmm. yes. That's a good thought question, mm -hmm. but uh, absolutely. I don't think we can really understand what it's like. You know, it wasn't just walking down a little garden path and, oh, okay, it's nighttime now, I'll go to bed. You know, no, it, it wasn't like that. But well, was, the, was the Lord walking with them or actually more in the spiritual sense that he was walking with them? I'll go back and I'll look into my Hebrew, but from my take on it, to them. I saw him really walking mm -hmm. with them. Yeah. Yeah really communing with them, fellowshipping with them in a very real way, not just spiritually or not just in the mind, but, but more, I don't want to say bodily, I'm fighting for another way to say it because God's not confined in the body, and we, this would be, anytime you see um, Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus Christ in the, in the original, that's called a Christophany, that means that, that we're seeing him in his human form, before he took on that human form. Because, again, 
that he can bring Yohanan up and show him the new heavens and the yeah. new earth and the, you know, all of this and tribulation and everything else. It is nothing for Messiah to reveal himself in a human form before he took on that human form. Melchizedek, Melchizedek is also um, a prime example because I fully believe that was the Lord. There's, there's, you can go either way, but I'm convinced it was the Lord himself. And yet he appeared to Avram like a little person, <coughs> like a king. And he, you know, made ties to yeah. him and, and all that. I never there. thought about it just, just now when she brought that up. I mean, he was, says that he walked with them. Right, right. Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. And yet when Jesus came down to earth, then he was out there. Mm -hmm. In the same body, physical body, he right. walked with us. Right, mm -hmm. and how does God look? Does he have, we know he has, we see the personification of God. Mm -hmm. When we see, like in Daniel, where the, um, okay, what is he, what's the, the Messiah called? I can't think, but he takes from the ancient of days. He takes the scroll out of his hand. So we know there's a, a hand there. We know we see in the description wool, you know, eye, hair like wool and, and eyes that are blaze. Um, I'm trying to think of all the description. But it gives us the idea of a form that we can relate to. Yes, you are 100% right. God is not formed like Yeshua Jesus is. He's the one that chose to confine himself into a body and, and be presented to us in that body. How he did that even in a seed, in a woman's womb, born as a baby. And wow. Wow. I imagine that, just in theory, once Adam and Eve committed that sin, how the world around them must have changed. Yes. Oh, yes. And so they themselves. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. That yes. they were so shameful. Right, right. They had not seen nakedness, and yet they hadn't changed. I mean, well, yeah, they had. I'm sorry, it, you know, because they had sinned, but I mean, the, they were created pure in their nakedness. You know, it wasn't sin. It wasn't something being ashamed of. You know, it was, it was a glorious body made in the image of, of God. And there again, how are we made in the image of God? You know, he made male and female in the image of God. So we're in that area that we'll never really fully understand. But in our minds, we do kind of put God into the form of a man yes. walking with. And in some way, he did personify himself to them, I believe, just like he did in Daniel and in Revelation other times. Yes, Father. Didn't God say to Adam and Eve, who told you you were made? Yes. I just love that line. Is that called a little child? child? Yeah. 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 The one who's got his hand caught in a cookie jar? The one who's wearing crumbs all over his mouth? The whole thing? Yeah. 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 And how sad. I cannot imagine for Adam and Eve the high cost they paid. Not just being cast out of that garden, because remember, they, they were sent out of the garden unless they eat from the tree of life and live forever. We're going to talk about the tree of life very shortly here if I watch my time. <laughs> um, but, but more than that, they lost that fellowship. They yes. lost that intimacy. They lost it. They ran and hid from him. You know, all they had known was the joy of being in his presence. They had known sweet fellowship. They had known, you know, the glory. They had to. Right. Yeah. 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 I, I, they paid a high price. So in the Garden of Eden, they were vegetarians. Yes. <laughs> so in heaven, we're vegetarians again. Because we're not murdering animals in heaven. I've got people behind you shaking heads. In heaven, we don't even have to eat. We can eat, and we do eat. But I cannot imagine eating something that was alive because then you, you cause death, and there's no death exactly. in there. So, but you're not going to miss me at all, you meat lovers. <laughs> but yeah, I, I would, who knows the glories of what we're going to eat? You know, won't get fat. I, you won't get fat. And I'll get you in just a moment, Laura, so if your hands getting tired, you can come down, just don't let them forget you. But I give the analogy, when we were in Israel, Israel is so small, they can vine ripen in the field, and serve it for breakfast that day. So we were there at the time of watermelon. The first day they put down a, a, a platter of watermelon, and those of us who discovered it, tried it, the word got out. 
wow. And to this day, I'm disappointed in every watermelon on the face of this earth. <laughs> it was so delicious. By the next morning, the word had gotten out. And so everybody's watching for those platters coming out and they're on them like nobody's business. By the third morning, they're waiting at the door, <laughs> following the poor guy out who's holding it up. <laughs> but my idea behind it is it was so delicious mm -hmm. that everything else I've ever had can pale in comparison. And that's still a watermelon made out of tainted earth, made out of sin-soaked earth, made by his hands, <coughs> not by the glory of God. I, I just, I laugh, I'm sure I'm going to say, I thought that was good. Ah, I didn't know it <laughs> So, yes, whatever we're eating, it's going to be far more glorious. And we will talk about fruit. Uh, maybe I'll just push this on so that we get to talk about the fruit. Because we will definitely be fruit eaters. And if you don't like fruit, don't worry, you will then. <laughs> Let me go Loretta, and then I'll go you, because I promised her. What I like about it is what Adam said. When you, you know, when you packed the butt on his wife, he said, well, you gave her to me. Well, he sort of knew he was with God way before she was, but he was, maybe that's why men are today when we pass the buck. Adam <laughs> did yes, the common sin of all. That's the problem. All the way through is everybody always, not me, not me. But God knows that Adam's at a higher stash because he had to put him in that responsible position. So, yes. It's too bad that we couldn't have experience. We only get a glimpse, don't we? But yes, yes. And if Adam could have talked to us, I'm sure what he would have said is how much it grieved his heart that it was through he and through he, you know, that that this world has come to this point. But look at they themselves. When does the first murder take place? Right with their own children. You know, their firstborn kills their secondborn. You know, it, it just, and in fact, in the Hebrew, I did may even be that they were twins. We don't, we can't say that for sure. But, you know, the, the, the very close, the very first generation, I cannot imagine how much it must have grieved them at the time, and they must have thought, if we had only not done this, we wouldn't be experiencing this. I like what Lady just said. It's very Latin. He didn't put his pants on. Los pantalones, no sé. He didn't get how would you say that in English? He didn't wear the pants. <laughs> 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 yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. Well, he wasn't even there at the time when the Satan deceived her. And the question is, where where was he? Why wasn't he? Exactly. I don't know. But anyway, we know Satan knew when to hit the trait, you know, and then wanted to do what he did. And there's a lot more behind that. I'll tell you what. When we get to Genesis, maybe we'll talk more about that. <laughs> okay? I'm going to move us on now. I think we're ready um, for verse 24. I think I've done it. Oh, I've got a revelation. Yeah. Okay. It's freezing on me. Revelation 25 and 24. Okay. <clears throat> yes, we talked about that the lamb is the, the lamb. And the, the lamp, the light, was always a picture of the lamp. The light is a picture of Yeshua Jesus, who is the express image of our God. Okay, verse 24, the nations will walk by his light. There we are. Remember I told you? The people are the nations. That gives us a clue to the fact that there's still nations on this new earth. That doesn't surprise me because God said, I will never, remember that word never, make a full end of Israel. So if there's an Israel for a nation, I'm not surprised that there are other nations also. Again, we see a God of order, a God who has plans, a God who has, you know, um, like a hierarchy. You have order that we're still seeing here, okay? But um, the nations happen to be the third class of people that have been mentioned. We have the bride, which we know is what you call the church, the called out assembly, okay? We know that this is our home. Then we have the children of Israel, and we know that when we talk about the earthly ones that did not get cast into like a fire that moved off into eternity, that were not ever, they, it was after the rapture that they got gotten saved, they lived out the, the tribulation, 
Messiah returned. They lived that thousand year millennial time without sinning. Remember, the only thing that brings death in the millennium is open rebellion, open sin. Um, God judges that rod of iron like Ananias and Sapphira. But if you did not rebel, you, you stayed in line, you lived up a thousand years. Then I gave you that horrible time, Gog and Magog, right here after the millennium when Satan was let loose to go through the earth for all those who feigned their allegiance to the Lord. All those who stayed in line and wow, I've got a tyrant of a ruler above me. I, I'll stay in line because I don't want to lose my life, but I'm not in line and uh, obedient to him because I want to because my heart is soft toward him. All those sands of the sea, their number, are the ones who came up with Satan to come up and dethrone Messiah, I believe, on the earthly and the heavenly scene. I believe that we see the double in action there. And that's when God says, enough is enough. And he, pulled, he comes to the complete stop. And we have our great white throne judgment. We have Satan first thrown into the lake of fire forever and ever, where the beasts and the false prophets are. So we know that's a forever. Now we have all those unsaved people who rebelled at the end of the millennium cast out forever. They've been judged according to their works. In fact, at this great white throne, everyone who has died without Messiah through the whole timeline has stood now before God for judgment of their the way they lived their lives. So they're rewarded for if they did good in this life and they weren't horrible, their suffering is less than someone who did horrible. God has a way to balance it and make it just and make it so. So all of that now We've come past that, but we've had people that lived out this millennium that were not part of Gog and Magog, that have come on now and moved into eternity with us. They're not up in heaven with us because, remember, they're called earth dwellers. Remember, the tribulation came on the earth dwellers, and we are the, our citizenship is in heaven. We know there was a time when we were raptured, and we put on immortality. I did it. <laughs> immortality. We know that there is a change there. We don't read about these people that lived through all this time. We don't read about them changing into immortality. So it is believed that what God had intended all the way back here with Adam and Eve, they would have continued on without, without um, aging, without sinning, without in death and its consequences of sin if they had not eaten of the fruit. That was their test. They failed their test, and all this came. So now we have, in essence, a new earth. I don't know what God will call it, but it, originally I believe he called the whole earth Eden because it says that God put man in Eden, the garden of God. Okay, so now you've got these people in their human bodies, but these human bodies are now not... Uh, affected by sin. Sin has been done away with. Remember, no more sin, no more death, no more mourning. Remember when we said that God wipes away all that puts the tear in the eye? doesn't just wipe away the tear, but he wipes away what causes the tear. So now you have the perfect earth. Remember, it's a new earth. It's not an earth that, that God cleaned out. It's a new earth. We saw that from the Hebrew. It's fresh. It's new. We've got a new earth that does not have the experience of <coughs> sin. It's not groaning and moaning. You know, this earth groans and moans. Yes. The wind is in a minor key. There are all kinds of ways that they tell us the seas, the sounds that are minor, that are groaning and moaning. We hear the Lord say, if I didn't speak, even the rocks would cry out. Now, we know that, that that's not a rock that's a, a human being turned into a rock. But the idea is even nature is feeling and experiencing the, the reality is a sin. Now you have a world that's not like that. And now God has put his human people who have passed all this time who have now move into an eternity that will never be affected by sin. It's going to be wonderful for them. But I'll tell you, as wonderful it is for them, they're earthbound. I don't care that they get to do what we get to do. We get to from planet to planet, galaxy to galaxy, and we get to keep going wherever the Lord wants to put us out. In fact, God took Satan, and he put Satan over what was, I believe, the original um, creation of this earth. 
Maybe God has a whole planet for you to be a ruler over. Who knows the glories that God has? Man is not hurt. I is not seen what God has prepared for those who love him. So we're moving into a whole new realm, a whole new thought. And it's really very hard to wrap your mind around it. But you've got to realize anything that's less, that's sin. So you just have to take that to a new level also. And remember how we talked before, and I'll bring it out again because I have new ones here today. If there's no more death, and those people continue on in their human bodies, and God had it intended for Adam and Eve to produce the fruit of their love, well, what's going to happen? Population I mean, explosion. Pretty population explosion. <laughs> pretty soon this world's going to get kind of tight. And we're going to be, or not we, but they would be like, so <laughs> okay? Yeah. And, and you know, I can't put my elbow out, God. i got a problem here, and, and there's another birth coming. <laughs> now, God's awesome and amazing. And here he is again, theory. I cannot give you scripture and verse, so I want to make sure that's clear. But I love the thought. It was not mine originally, but when it was introduced to me, I loved it. What if God takes from this earth, and I'm talking this new one that's, that's new been earth. populated, the new earth. What if he takes a people from them and puts the, these people on another planet, makes that planet inhabitable, however he chooses to do it, but makes it inhabitable for them. So now they're a few on a whole yeah. sphere, a whole globe. They go on reproducing. And what is everybody doing through all of time? Giving God the glory. God the glory yeah. Praising God. Ser worshiping and serving Him in, in that capacity. So now you've got this place full of people praising God. Now you've got this place full of people praising God. And if this goes on and on and on, in time, you can, in your mind, just see the heavens alive with worship to our God who is above it all, who created it all. And remember, the heavens have yet to be measured. Maybe they're not even ending. They're definitely not measurable. Maybe God's still creating more in those heavens out there. Who knows? But it would go on forever. And I just love the thought of seeing peoples all over praising my God, giving him the glory that's due him. And in some ways serving him, doing whatever he has to do. <coughs> Again, beyond our ways, beyond our thoughts. Wow. Is it not glorious? Do we not have an awesome God? Mm -hmm. uh, now, we know mm -hmm. from Scripture, when I bring us back down to just this new earth, we know that, it, that the new Jerusalem hovers over the earth of <coughs> Jerusalem during the millennium. We have it here. But we also now know that this one is the... The, the new sun of the new earth, okay? So when we look at scriptures, if you want to know which time it's talking about, be very careful that you key into the words that are being said. If it's descriptive of the millennial kingdom, then it's talking about this time, okay? When I took you to Yeshua, Isaiah 66, I think it was verse 22, 22, 23, right around there. When I took you there, that was his creation of the new heavens and the new earth, in fact, maybe we ought to just go there real quick because I think it mentions life there. If it does, you're still going to get my idea. So, Isaiah chapter 66. Almost the end of the book. I can't even find the book. I'm in my Jewish Bible and I've got to think, where did all the prophets go? Where did my prophets go? Who took my prophets? I picked the wrong one. Oh my goodness. Okay, let me back in. You're all going to do that before I am. This <laughs> stuff is just not. That's why I have my good old hard copy here. This one is not going to let me write down. Isaiah. You know where to find Isaiah? Yes. Okay. They teach her that because she's good. Okay, Isaiah 66. Okay, yes. 22, for as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. He's talking to Israel. Israel's going to be one of the nations in the new heavens, I'm sorry, in the new earth, okay? Mm -hmm. And it shall come to pass that from one, okay, they do have a moon, because from one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come 
to worship before me. They shall go forth and look. Well, okay, this is getting another thing. It doesn't get into the light. I thought it did there. I'll try to find you somewhere where it talks about that my idea is maybe if I even look at my own references. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, I can tell you. Um, look at what they're doing. They're bringing in. Okay. Verse 23. We know it's the new heavens. We know that the, the, the new Yerushalayim is the light of it. And when it says, from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me. Okay, they're going to come up to worship God. Because where is God? He's not dwelling on that, that new earth. He's dwelling in heaven. He's dwelling, we know that he's the light of our new Yerushalayim. So they come up and they come in, they bring their glory into it. That's whatever they're bringing to the Lord. Is that the king, kings of the earth? Yeah. Yes. That's yes, and that's what that's in verse 24. We're going to go back to Revelation 21, look at verse 24, and that's what I'm referring to. I probably should have read it first. The nations will walk by flight, that's Israel and other nations, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. When they come up to worship, they're going to bring a, a, not a bloody sacrifice, but they're going to bring something. They're going to bring something to worship the Lord with. I see it where now the crops that are brought in, the first fruits of the crops are brought in and given to the Lord before they're ever eaten, before they're ever consumed. They bring the first to the Lord. It's something like that. So we see that still going on. So we see his children. Is that what it means, the king? Well, the kings, the kings of the earth, earth probably a representative of the nation, the head, the heads of the nation. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's what I was yeah. Thinking. Rather than yeah. every little person, you know, will have they'll have a representative who is sitting like a king over them. Because again, you still have authority, you still have rule, you still have order, but it will be perfect order. It won't be anybody getting out of line. It won't be attack and pull. You know, I want to be boss. I want to be on top. You know, nothing like that. That's all sin tainted. This will be the way heaven works. Heaven's got his heart. <coughs> you have um, two archangels that we know by name, Michael and Gabriel, Michael and Gabriel, yeah. okay? They're archangels. They're over other angels, okay? There may be more than that, and we don't know what all positions there are. We know Satan even has princes and, and powers. It, the description gives in Ephesians 6, chapter uh, 6, verse 1, um, talks about an order that Satan has. We know that. He's got his bigger henchmen and his lesser henchmen. If, <laughs> if you're somebody that's a bigger target that he's got to work really hard to knock you in your faith, he's going to send one of his stronger demons to, to go after that one. So it's just, we can't, we still see an order, we still see rank, but it's not anything that anyone bristles at. Yes? Um, I'm just thinking right now, because you were saying, um, well, the Bible was saying that they're offering, they have an offering, mm -hmm. which is likened to Christ, the first fruit, you know, and, and especially when he went to heaven after the resurrection. Uh, okay. So, because this are earthlings, we're the raptured one, mm -hmm. we're out there, we all, <laughs> 2,000 years of learning all these things. So these earthlings are still there. Yes. And who's their teachers to do it? Who's their teachers? Oh, Yeshua. Well, yes, but who is he sending out to help? Oh, oh, oh yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. 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 But it, is, yeah. am I right in that? I believe in that so. Line of I believe so, yes. Because they're getting trained, like, yes. trained in right, their righteousness, a sweet heart being trained in right. our righteousness. Right. And, and in some way, that's hard for us to understand they'll still grow in their knowledge and their learning, but they grow without the sin part. Yes. Never a sin is going to enter in. Yes. Never a lie is going to come in. Yes. Never anything that, that can warp this picture. That's what God promised. And why I stress that word forever. If all this is forever, it's either all everything we're talking about forever or none of it's forever. Because forever either means forever or it doesn't. We can't have it in between. So definitely... These little babies that are, are born are going to grow. A baby doesn't pop out today walking, talking, feeding itself, taking care of itself. They grow. And as they grow, even the Lord himself, here's my example. It's even the Lord himself, in his humanity, it said he grew in the knowledge of, of his father. You know, 
I don't get that. How did you grow, Lord? <laughs> but he did in some way. And that, that I think is uniquely to give us an understanding that yes, and they'll need teachers. And I believe also the giving, of the like bringing in a sacrifice again. I'm not talking the bloody sacrifice because the blood has been, you know, that's done. That's done. It's finished. But it, it teaches them, you know, to put God first, to bring him the best, to worship him, to honor him, you know. And I think when they, they see him, because they will see him, but there's no way they will not see him. <coughs> Mommy, what's those marks? You know, what does that mean? You know, well, the Lord might say, you know, let me send Kathy. She knew it from that other side of let her explain that high cost of what death is, of what that bloodshed meant, because this is something they can't comprehend. But the love that will well up in them, they're going to want to give them something, and they, he, he makes it so they can. So, um, so, you know how in the parable when God gives a talent, talent and gift, in the millennium kingdom, when when those of us who have been raptured in, in our new body, are, is God going to use those gifts to minister to those who are still on earth? Well, in, in the, I'm not sure I'm following your whole question. In the millennial, when we're ruling and reigning with the Lord, right. what yeah. we've done with our talents here on this earth, like the gifts well, that the gifts. That, um, that he did use each of each of us. Uh, yes, if we did well with what he gave us, do, does he use our gifts to minister to those? My dad's way of putting it, and I think it was very insightful. Present training for uh -huh. future reigning. That's right. Nothing's lost on the Lord. Mm -hmm. Nothing. So yes, what you've gone through in particular, he's going to use in some way in a glorious way yes. in the millennium through you. Yes, I do believe that. The same way he took Shaul Paul, gave him a background of his Judaism, raised him up with the best teachers, gave him that education so that he could carry that into when the Holy Spirit anointed him to write the scriptures to bring out that fullness because you have to know that background to get the fullness. But what did he also make Shaul Paul? A Roman citizen. And he needed that citizenship at a key point in his life. He called it out. I'm a Roman citizen. It changed everything at that moment. Everything that is made up of our lives, I believe God was ordaining it for our future. That there was a purpose. Who he born you, where he born you, what gifts he gave you, what around he gave you for you to use for his glory. And if you do it well, if you trade well with the talents he's given you, he can use you in the kingdom in a great way because, hey, you showed yourself responsible. The same way you can have kids today. And if you have one child in the family that's very responsible and one that isn't, well, what are you going to do when you have something very important that needs to be carried out? You're not going to give it to your slacker. You're going to give it to your very responsible child, even if that child was the younger one. You will still give that responsibility to that one. Well, in essence, the Lord will reward us for our being responsible. Rowena? So the people in the New Earth, will they have access to the New Jerusalem? Apparently, yes. Apparently they come up because it says the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. Where are they bringing their splendor into? Into the New Jerusalem. So they're going to come through those pearly gates also. So they don't come in flesh and shape. bones, even though they're not even though, body. even though they're flesh and bone, yes, yes. Well, in some way, God will enable them. We'll carry them on our backs. If you didn't hear her, she says, we'll carry them on our backs. We can move fast. No. <laughs> Who knows how? But all I know is that it's not going to be a magic carpet in the sky. God's more creative than that. <laughs> will, the, will, the, will, the, will the people on earth, will they eventually have their new... New we never learn of them having a glorified body like we get. Uh -huh. We never read of that. We don't read that that would have been what was intended for Adam and Eve in the beginning either. Remember, God didn't say anything about that. That He told them to to eat, you know, from the tree of the of life. That was giving them life. We'll talk about that tree when we get to. The new heaven. But no, we never learn it. That's why I think they can go on and populate this entire universe, which is only 
one universe. We're only a galaxy in the middle of how many galaxies. I mean, we don't know how far out there it goes. All we know is it blows our minds. You'll be our intergalactic supermen. I just want to walk in the garden. I just want to walk in the garden. <laughs> No, you work in the I guarantee you, you will be 100% satisfied. If we meet in the garden, we'll have you in the garden. All I do is I just want to be like a little puppy dog at his feet. Just let me, just let me right there. Just let me right there. I'll lay my head on your feet. I'll look up at you with adoring eyes. That's all I want. For the millennium, I'll be leading tours in Israel. So if you want to see Israel, I've never seen it. I put my order in a long time ago, and Lord said yes. I get to take my suitcase to have it see. Okay. Okay. Yes, I know, and that's why I'm laughing. That I would love nothing more than to show that 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 piece of prime real estate that God chose to put His name on when He is being glorified there. I would love to show that. Having said that, hopefully I'll show you the earthly next year if we're still here. Yeah. Yeah, I think what we are doing now is we will ready. Yes. So this is dress rehearsal. This is dress rehearsal for the wedding. Yes. Because you find that yes. positions. <coughs> yes. Remember the bridegroom comes and takes the bride back to live in the home he has prepared for his bride. And that's the what's called the Oriental custom, and that's the area of the Orient. It's not Japan, it's what was called Orient at that time. So we look into those customs. So yes, absolutely, Tony, this, this is what we're doing. So let's look back real quick again, okay? Um, your verses like Isaiah 2, 5, and I've got 4, 6, 61, and 19 through 21 of chapter 60 also. Those are during the millennium. That's what I'm trying to show you. Be sure when you read the context that you separate. You look around and look at what's going on. You'll be able to tell when there's a millennial. Very little scriptures tell us of the, the, the eternity future. Very little. The majority of your scriptures are going to talk about the millennial time. But when it talks about, at the end of Isaiah especially, that new heavens, verse 22, the new heavens, the new earth, that clues us in that that is beyond this millennial time. Because millennium is not a new earth. At the beginning of the millennium, they're burning the weapons of war. They're burying the dead bodies. You know, Egypt is in trouble for 40 years. We've got Babylon always just being the existence of, of jackals and howls and owls or whatever. I mean, we don't even really know what some of those are. That's during the millennial time. Remember, it's that new, a fresh, new heavens and earth that we're talking about that has the people living in it and bringing their glory up into the new Jerusalem to <coughs> kind of worship God up in there. Okay. Um, and the authority of the new Jerusalem is universally recognized. There's no Satan. There's no fight against, you know, the God... It's all in agreement. Everyone realizes this is the authority. God is on his throne in heaven. He, well, he's on his throne now, whether they recognize it or not. But all will recognize, all will bow, all will worship, all will bring up whatever they're bringing up when they're supposed to, however God um, ordains it. And when it says that they bring their glory in, the Greek word for glory, and we have revelation in Greek manuscripts. So when we go back to that Greek word, it's doxan, like our D-O-X-A-N. I mean, it's not exactly those letters, but it's close to that sound in our English. And that means glory or honor or magnificence. Mm -hmm. So the best of mm -hmm. that human civilization, whatever it has to offer, the best of the best of it is what they're going to be bringing up. It would be, you know, like us putting on our finest and bringing our finest to the Lord. You know, we, let's say that, that we're farmers and we've got the crop. Mm -hmm. And in a crop, you've got some that, that look almost perfect, and then you've got others that aren't as good. Well, it's that mm -hmm. perfect. You'd be taking that perfect. You'd be putting on your best, and you'd, you'd know you were going into the presence of the king, and you're bringing a gift that you, you wanted to be worthy of the king, so you'll bring the best of the best. That's what this is talking about, that kind of glory that, that, that God has enabled them to... <coughs> 
I don't want to use the word manufactured, but to, to be that I don't know what it is. Uh, but whatever God has enabled them to do, they're going to give back part of that to the Lord to show their appreciation. Okay, verse 25, we'll hurry on a little bit, see maybe we'll get to that, that tree, that fruit, but we may not, we'll see. Verse 25 is gates will never close. Now we're talking about the pearly gates, three on each side. We've got 12. We talked about 12 last week, so I'm not going into the significance of it now. But every single one of those gates, if you want to look at it north, south, east, and west, however you want to look at it, three gates on each side never close. They stay open all day because night will not exist there. When do we close and lock our doors? We close them at night when we go to bed. You know, it's, it's a shutting out. New Jerusalem never shuts out, and it's always open, always open. <coughs> There's no enemies that need to be protected from, no enemies. All enemies have been destroyed. Nothing is left that is going to tarnish or hurt or harm in any way. Constant perfection. It, that shows us security. It also shows that there is constant communication with earth. Now, because we see they have this as their sun, but it did mention the moon, and it does mention Sabbaths, it mentions time. We know in some way they're going to still have a time. I cannot imagine that they're time-bound, because to me that's sin again. I don't think Adam and Eve felt stress. Oh, the day's ending, and I'm not getting my work done. <laughs> like, yeah, that's not, that's sin. That's because of sin in this life. So, but still there's an order, and there's something that, that is continually going on, and maybe it, again, is still telling the story so that they understand. Just like for us now, we know the gospel of stars tells the story. But there's no night because uh, the Lamb is the light of it. He's eternally present. We can't turn it off. Let me bring you real quickly because I think it's worth it. And in fact, because of it, I will not get us to our new, our new fruit. We'll have a freebie lesson next week. Okay. <laughs> and you can read ahead, read the beginning of chapter 22 about the new fruit. Find out, and, and there's different ways to look at it. So find out what you think, what kind of fruit, how often, where, when, all of that. Come with your ideas, okay? But let me take you through light, because the light of God radiates through Scripture. We talked about it a little bit, but let me take you. Light is the evidence of the presence of God. We yes. said that, okay? His first creative act, we read about when he's giving us his acts of creation, is creating light for a dark, chaotic, empty world. Now remember, the chaos on the face of this earth was judgment from God because of sin, because Satan had fell from his kingdom, which was the earth. God <laughs> does never, does never. He does a lot better than I do with my mouth. He does not create chaos. No. So we know this, that the earth became without form and void. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that it was made that way, it became. Something happened. We'll go into that again. We've gone through it a little bit, but we'll go into it in full depth when we start our book of Genesis study. Mm -hmm. That we know that, that the first that God brought in was this light. Refracted sunlight burst into color. When he brought the sun in into the earth in the way he did, it brought color in. Because we're told, and I, I don't get it, but we're told when you get out into outer space where it's dark, mm -hmm. there's no color. Mm -hmm. You know, I understand from the Hubble, the colors are gorgeous. Mm -hmm. So we're talking way out there. We're talking where the black holes would be. We're talking about that denseness mm -hmm. and that darkness. But so we see that, that God brought color into this world. Mm -hmm. And I've yet to see the color he's talking about. Mm -hmm. I understand when you go see a laser show, you get shot at a point in time, if they still do it, where everything is, is pitch dark. And they shoot a laser, what they consider the closest to perfect red that they can be. And I understand the response from the audience is, <gasps> you know, mm -hmm. it, it, yeah. it's just, almost more than the mind can take in. And that's just one shot, and that's just man's attempt. But God brought color into this world. Are we not glad? And the colors of heaven, wow. Okay, and bringing it in to me immediately brings me into the colors of the rainbow. It reminds me that, yes, because of my love for the rainbow, but remember also God said he gifted his bow when he gave it to man. So this is something that was very important to him, and we know the rainbow is a sign of God's covenant. God gifting, God covenanting with man is a gift. That's what we have. As we move past the light and the creation, 
we see it in the rainbow. We come to the, the I'm going to say for our third point, we've got our stars that are shining lights because the stars are light at night. Um, we see also in the stars God's plan, his plan throughout all time in astronomy, not astrology. Astrology is Satan's counterfeit. Stay away from it. But in the astronomy, the study gives us what we read in the scriptures. <coughs> Abraham saw, narrated, told the story he saw from the stars, and God applied it as righteousness in his life. Well, righteousness only comes from believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua and Jesus. So somehow Abraham saw that in the stars. So here's your light telling your story three times. Now let me take you to Moshe, okay, Moses. And first he sees a burning bush. Now, this bush doesn't get consumed. I imagine it was the Shekinah glory filling that bush. It, 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 the bush probably helped um, camouflage him enough that when he saw the burning bush, it didn't burn his eyeballs out like we've talked about. But we see again God presenting himself to Moshe through light. And of course, Moshe sees his Shekinah glory. He blows from it himself. When the tabernacle is given, the Shekhinah glory is in the Holy of Holies. Remember, they go in with the incense. Incense is a smoke screen. It had to be, again, to protect them from the full-on force of that glory. But here's God, through light, bringing his glory. And remember, in that Holy of Holies, that's where the mercy seat was. That's where God meets us in that in the, in the light of his love, I'll put it that way. He meets us in the light of his love. So we see that coming all the way through. We know that, that with the children of Israel, they were led by the, the pillar of fire at night. That's light. Again, we see it in that way. Now think about David's words, and I used it earlier. God's word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. What's, what's the psalmist declaring? God, you are my guide. You are a light to my feet. You are lighting my path. He's not sending the light so far out. David didn't know what was going to happen 10 years later, but he knew what was going to be the next step when he stayed in tune with his God. And that's why he could write, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Okay, and we also know from Psalm 36 and verse 9, by the way, Psalm 119, 105, for the word is a lamp unto my feet, that Psalm 36 and 9 says, in your light, we see light. Psalm 36 and 9, that gives a whole new meaning to that also. In your light, God, we see light. God enlightens us. And then uh, Malachi, Malachi, chapter 4 and verse 2, Let's go there real fast. This is a prophecy of the Messiah. Okay, Malachi. Malachi, chapter 4 and verse 2. The last book of your original, and I like to call it that rather than old, because old gives people the idea of antiquated and there we go. Huh? Okay, i got to see if I can find it here real quick. Um, in, okay, here we go. Chapter 4 and verse 2 in your English. If you're in a complete Jewish Bible, you need to look in chapter 3 and verse 20. They, can, they carry chapter 3 on. They didn't break it into 3 and 4 in the complete Jewish Bible. Same contents, just broken up a little differently. It says, but to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. Son of Righteousness, that is a play on because it says you end, but we know it is the Son, S-O-N, who is Malachi 4, verse 2, and here is chapter 3, verse 20. Yeah, because you'll be lost otherwise trying to find it. Yeah, okay, so we know this is a picture of Messiah who will be coming. If we read that whole area in there, I'm going to read it in my English to match more of you rather than the Hebrew. Um, let me get them real fast. We're going to read in the beginning, um, Behold, the day comes that shall burn like an oven. As it goes on, and we know it's the day of the Lord that's going to come. But it's telling us, verse 4, Remember the law of Moses, Moshe, my servant, which I commanded 
for all Israel. And then verse 5 tells us Elijah, Eliyahu, the prophet, is going to come. He's going to turn the heart of the fathers back to the children, the children to the fathers, before a curse is going to come on the face of this earth. We know that this is all prophetic speaking of the Messiah. The Messiah is the one who comes with healing in his wings. I skip it, but in verse 2, to those who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will arise with healing in his wings. Okay, it's a double play on the word Son. The Son of Righteousness, and he's going to bring healing, not just a physical healing, although the Son feels wonderful when you're sick. It's a greater, it's a spiritual healing that he's talking about, and that's what we see come on down through these verses. Remember all of these. This is a picture of it. And even the fact of Eliyahu, Elijah the prophet, coming before the sun returns. Mm -hmm. And we see that fulfilled. Um, it would have been fulfilled in Yohanan the Mercer, John the Baptist, when Yeshua Jesus was here his first time, if they would have accepted him as Messiah. But because they didn't, we see it in the tribulation time. If you believe he's one of the two witnesses that comes back. But you see how he ties sun, light, all of this through scripture all the way through. Um, now, look at, with me real quick at Yeshaya, Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 2. We are going to finish on this study, but this is a great study. It gives you a good insight to the Jewishness of your scriptures. I want Isaiah. I will find it. Oh, I hit there. Okay, I'm done with the Isaiah <laughs> 9 and verse 2. Chapter 9 and verse 2. And remember Isaiah. He is a Jewish prophet. He's writing to Israel. There is no church yet. Mm -hmm. This is 700 B.C. There's no church even thought of yet in Scripture for us you know, to, to be. So when he says the people that have walked in darkness, he's talking about Israel. They're walking in spiritual darkness. But they've seen a great light. Okay, what's that light that they saw? Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus. Go down to verse 60. I think if I'm in, no, not in the right chapter. Go to chapter 60. Yes, go to chapter 60. And we're just, we're not going to get the whole chapter, but just the first verse, maybe two verses. Chapter 60 and verse 1. Arise, shine, for thy light is come. The glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Does that give you any reason to doubt what Isaiah was meaning when he said, that they saw a great light. Here's the light that has arisen. This light is the glory of the Lord. It makes it very clear. So light in scripture is very much a picture of the Messiah of him coming in all his glory. And I think it's a great analogy because we can't contain light. We can't fully understand light. But we see the greatness and the results from it. Okay, again and finally, and this is where I'll conclude, the image of the light pointing to the Messiah, I will remind you that it was a star uh, that announced his birth to the ancient astronomers. Okay, remember the wise, the, the kings of the east, the wise men, were following his star to come and worship because they knew the child had been born. It was a star. It was the star. It was a star in the sky, and it was in Israel's constellation. It was more than that. It was the virgin... Uh, maiden that they saw, they saw the, the, oh, what's the line called? There's a line that runs through. It'll come back to me in a moment. If it doesn't, I'll do it next week. I'll start with this. Meridian. The Meridian. Thank you. That shot through the women's breast that said to them who had studied that she was uh, nurturing a baby. She was mm -hmm. nourishing the baby. The baby had been born. They knew because that baby was in Israel's picture, the baby king had been born. Mm -hmm. So they were coming to worship the king who had been born, king of the Jews. That's why they went to Herod in the palace. They're looking for the king. They weren't looking for one who had been born humbly as the little lamb of God. They were looking for that king. But all that, that star was announcing his birth. That light was pointing to his birth. Yochanan, John's own words. Go to John 1, and I know I'm hurrying through this, but I think we can, we know it, you know, some of this is review for some of you, but it's good to see it all together. John chapter 1, Yochanan chapter 1, we're going to go to verse 4 first. In him was life, and life was the light of man. Uh, let's look at verse 5. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness is not suppressed. Darkness is not contained. Does, is John drawing on Isaiah? 
There's been a great light that's been seen, people walk in darkness, but here's a light that the darkness can't contain. Is, does that sound like what Yochanan just said? Yeah. Sure. He studied Isaiah. That would have been the scripture he would have known. Look at verses 7 through 9. He came to be a testimony to bear witness concerning the light, so that through him everyone might put his trust in God and be faithful to him. He himself, Yochanan himself, was not that light. No, he came to bear witness concerning the light. <coughs> Remember, they were looking at Yochanan, at John the Baptist, and they were wondering about his ministry. They're thinking he's the greatest, and he's telling them, no, 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 I'm not even worthy to untie the, the shoe of the one who is greater. And this is what he's pointing out very clearly here in 7 through 9. He is saying that there is one who is the, the light who is coming. I'm pointing the way to the light. Now, who claimed to be the light? Jesus. 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 Give me a scripture where? You're both like how one in Spanish and one in English. Yohanan, John, chapter 8, verse 12. Know your addresses. If you need to prove the point, know where to find them. I am the light of the world. Okay, and he also says, if no man comes to the Father, but through him. Okay, so we see it all tied together in that. When Shaol, before he became Paul, when he meets the Lord, how does he meet the Lord? Right, the right light. He's riding on his horse. He's proud of what he's doing. He's going after all the Christians, taking out everyone he can. He doesn't care if they're male or female. He's putting them in prison. He's seeing to their death. He is he's doing God a favor. God has to knock him off of his high horse, but he does it in a light. There's a light that came out of heaven that blinded him. It was so bright. What do you think that light was? Shaking the glory? Yeah, and it blinded Shaul Paul. Of course, God gives him his sight back. Now, final verses. First John. Who's the author of First John? John. 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 The, the same author as Big John is the Little John. And what other book? Revelation. Revelation. I've got such a smart class. You guys don't need me. First John, chapter 1. You're excited? Good. First John, chapter 1, and verse 5. And this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you. God is light, and there is no darkness in him, none. Follow it up with chapter 2 and verse 8 for our final verse. For our final verse. There we go. Chapter 2, verse 8. She's doing it without quite loud enough for me. Yet I'm writing you a new command, and it's it's real reality is seen both in him and in you because the darkness is passing away. The true light is already shining. Who's Yohanan talking to here? Not, not who's he talking about. Who's his audience? Who is he talking to? He's talking to believers. He's talking to those. That's why he can say that the light is already shining in us. What are we to be? Light. Let your light so shine before men that they will see your Father in heaven and glorify you. Matthew 517? I need to know my address. Sorry. Yes, Rowan. I was just wondering, so the new earthlings don't even have an idea of what darkness is? No, apparently not. No, they'll see a lesser light if it's still the same because there's the moons. And there's some sort of a cycle of time, but there will there not be darkness. There can't be, because there's the union rich lines, glory can't be contained. It's all transparent, it's all going out. So, no, I don't believe they will know what darkness is. And darkness to me is a, a, a result of sin. You know, I don't believe Adam and Eve saw darkness before. You know, it says that they walk in the cold and they eat. So, you've got evening, you've got morning, you've got the changes. You do have day and night too, though. So maybe they did know that, that sin had already, you know, entered into the. Well, night is a different description, not like the night that. Right. That's what I'm thinking. 
exactly that, that it'll be in some way different than what we're comprehending at this point in time. And Michelle, I'm convicted of what you just said, that we are the, the light of the world. Now we and are. I'm, I'm convicted how I, uh, how I act, what I say, what I say to somebody. It's, it's a conviction. It, it should be to all of us, because yeah. if you realize, you may be the only Bible that somebody reads. They're reading you, they're reading your actions, they're reading your attitude. So when you lose your temper, when you're short with somebody, when you cheat, <coughs> you don't do things the way that they should be done, who's quick to say that to? Oh, that's a Christian for you. You know, they're looking for it, the pitfalls. Granted, we can't be perfect, but we should be striving to be a light right that they're drawn to because they're seeing the light of the Lord in us. They're not seeing our light, they're seeing His light in us. Let us reflect His light. But it is a challenge. And on that, since we're not in the New Jerusalem yet, we'll stop here. We'll pick up at verse 26 next week. When we start with verse 26, we are just very short to the tree life. Tree life is going to come up in verse 2. So we're very, very close. Um, won't take us long to get there. I'm sure we'll get to the fruit and the tree and the life and all of that. I'll ask you a question ahead of time. Is the tree real or is it symbolic? Do they have to eat? Do we have to eat if the tree is real? That's a question. Okay, bring your answers and we'll discuss it when we get there. Did I see a hand over here? I just saw the clock. Let's close in prayer. Lord God, thank you for the glory that is ours in you. May we shine for you while we are here. And thank you we will walk in the light of life forever and ever with you. Lord, bless each one who is here. Take them safely and enable them this week to shine to all around that you want them to be the living testimony. And I include me in that also, Lord, please. Thank you. Thank you for using your man because you are the one who works through us. You don't call us because we're able. You call us. If we show you we are available, you call us and you make us able. Thank you. You do it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Sorry.